Rabbis, nice to see you again. Um, I hope that you enjoyed the first session. I've certainly appreciated seeing the way the discussion has begun online. Uh, since the last time also you actually enjoyed the privilege of, uh, of being awarded the degree, so let me say mazel tov to all of you who are participating. Uh, I'm very excited to do the second session. Uh, it is, as you know from the syllabus, devoted to a discussion of bar bat mitzvah. Uh, I know that some of you will have seen, it's on the syllabus as well, but some of you uh, will have read before the piece that I published a number of years ago in Conservative Judaism, summer 2001, on bar bat mitzvah. For those of you familiar with that material, there is going to be some considerable repetition in the discussion today. Uh, I apologize for that. I hope that this enriches your uh, appreciation of it somewhat. Uh, and for those of you who haven't read it, obviously uh, this will be new, but you have the opportunity to follow up in the article. In any case, I encourage everybody to contribute to discussion online because I will be making some observations and suggestions that I did not put in print. So this will not be complete repetition by any means. Um, this is a difficult topic because we all have our own very personal experiences of bar and bat mitzvah. Uh, I'd like to use the personal to help me make a claim for the general. And it's a very simple one. That is, those of you who remember your bar or, or bat mitzvahs, um, there was that strange contradiction in experience, the message that we got and what we actually felt. Uh, speaking for myself, we all know the message of arriving at Jewish adulthood, and you know, today you are a man. Um, but uh, I don't know about you at age 13, it was perfectly clear to me at age 13 that I was far from a man, and I knew that there were many years uh, to go before I could have that experience, before I could feel genuinely an adult, uh, even in the community. So I've always been puzzled by that communication, and when I began studying sources relevant to it, it became clearer and clearer to me, um, A, that the tradition does not believe that what we call bar or bat mitzvah is the beginning of adulthood, not by any means. But more importantly, what does emerge from the sources, I think, suggests a critique of the way we teach bar and bat mitzvah and the way we actually conduct it in our communities. Uh, and I'd like to raise that critique based upon the foundation of the sources. I begin with a very simple observation. That is, that everything that we associate today with bar mitzvah and also with bat mitzvah um, was not, traditionally speaking, associated with that stage. That is to say, all of the things we imagine beginning at the point of bar bat mitzvah, before a Jew doesn't, and when bar bat mitzvah comes, a Jew does, uh, this simply wasn't a transition that the earliest tradition, and even the very developed tradition, I might add, uh, imagined. The first source that I recommended to you is the Gemara from Sukkah 42a, which makes this point, I think, very, very clearly, just to read the Baraita, which makes the point, Tanu Rabbanan, Katan Hayodea Linanea, Chayav belulav, litatev, chayav betzitzit, lishmor tfilin, aviv lokeach lo tfilin, and so forth. Um, tzitzit, the fringes, tfilin, things that we understand to be part of the ritual actually of becoming a bar mitzvah. One learns to do these things, uh, tfilin in particular, when one is about to become a bar mitzvah. Uh, the source is very, very clear, and the halacha, I might add, is very, very clear. Um, when one is old enough to be able to do these things, in the case of tefillin, when one is old enough to guard the tefillin from being soiled, and that would be far before the 13th birthday, uh, one acquires tefillin, or one's father acquires tefillin for one, and one begins to wear it. Um, the same goes even for an aliyah to the Torah. You, you all know this source because it's been central to our discussions on the question of whether women can have aliyot. Hakol olin luminyan sheva, afilu katan vafilu isha. Um, we've discussed the afilu isha a lot, even a woman, but what we've neglected to do is note that a katan quite explicitly can take an aliyah. Now, I know there are discussions later on but the source is clear. 
um, that this is not something that needs to await a bar bat mitzvah. And so all of the rituals we associate uh, at the earlier stages, in fact, were not associated at all. The question then becomes, okay, well, if there is not a ritual enactment of this in the way that we're accustomed, then what does happen at age 12 and 13, and what does it represent? Uh, one more point on what it doesn't represent. Um, I gave you as one of the sources the wonderful text from Baba Batra, which discusses the fictional founding of an educational system in Israel. Uh, the story is an interesting one. I, I do take it to be absolutely fictional. Uh, but the imagination of this fiction is very important for our consideration. Uh, it begins by showing that the initial moves to establish a system of education in Israel were bound to fail. They weren't sufficient. They weren't broad enough. Um, if you were to set up teachers only in Jerusalem, then children in Jerusalem uh, would be educated, but not Jewish children elsewhere. Interestingly, as a response to the immediate recognition of that failure, according to the legend given in the Gemara, this is Baba Batra 21a, um, they propose the following middle step. It's also a failed step, but an interestingly failed step. Um, Keven tet zayin, kevet yud zayin. Um, they said in response to the Jerusalem attempt and failure, okay, let's set up teachers uh, for quote-unquote children everywhere uh, and begin bringing in the young people when they are 16 and 17 years old. Now, this is obviously preposterous. Uh, if you begin to educate young people for the first time at 16 and 17, they will never succeed, this education. And as it says here quite explicitly, they would begin to be uproarious, rebellious, and this would lead to anger on the part of the teacher who would kick them out. But it's important for us to note that 16 and 17 is considered to be an appropriate age for education. This is not an age of adulthood yet. Um, there's something in between here before adult responsibility when it is appropriate to continue educating young people as long as they've begun being educated before that. But there's also a recognition that 16 and 17 is an age where when you, if you try to bring children, young people, into a classroom, uh, they're going to resist, they're going to rebel if they're not accustomed to it and if it's not interesting. Uh, this is adolescence as we know. This is one of several sources indicating adolescence, but uh, to me it does it quite eloquently uh, and even a little bit playfully. Their recognition that nothing happened at age 12 or 13 um, that led for these uh, young people to be adults. So what is Bar Bat Mitzvah? Uh, the source that for me uh, speaks to that most directly and fully is the texts from Mishnah Nida that I uh, asked you to prepare uh, in two sections, one uh, quite a bit longer uh, and one uh, somewhat, uh, well, I should say much more briefly. Um, the Mishnah in chapter 6 is very explicit in its discussion in a way that helps us a great deal. Um, you'll note that it doesn't discuss age 12 and 13. In chapter 5, it is discussed. In chapter 6, it's not. Uh, in chapter 6, the text refers to a physical sign. Tinoket shehivia shte sa'arot, o cholezet o mitya um, A girl who uh, develops pubic hair, in this case, two pubic hairs, um, certain legal consequences follow. The most important of the being, and this appears in different places in different manuscripts of the Mishnah, but it is uh, in all of the versions, chayevet bekol mitzvot hamurat b'Torah. She's obligated to do all of the mitzvot of the Torah, um, and the same applies to a tinok, that's the rabbinic Hebrew word for a young man, tinoket for a young woman. It acts like as a child until they become an adult, but it's a very flexible term. Uh, when he becomes an adolescent, I want to use that term here uh, and come back to it, he's obligated uh, in all of the mitzvot of the Torah. Now, 
There is no age given here. It speaks only about physical signs. But this clearly relates to the texts that I asked you to consider um, in the prior chapter. There are a number of them, some of them on your syllabus, which I'm not going to review now, which talk about education, preparation for fasting, for example, uh, in the years before 12 for a girl and 13 for a boy, then the clear obligation to fast for Yom Kippur at age 12 for a girl and 13 for a boy, Midar Raita. Um, all of this comes back in a very simple way to the discussion here in Chapter 5 of Nida. So, with the age. When she's 11 years and one day old, her vows would be checked. When she turns 12, this is her 12th birthday, remember, we call the first birthday um, the day that occurs on the first day after the first year is over. So this is their first one year and one day, two years and one day, and so forth. So on what we call her 12th birthday, um, her nidarim, her vows, are assumed to be uh, fully legal and valid. Uh, why, we would have to ask ourselves. Uh, this clearly relates to understanding. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, during the middle year from her 11th to her 12th birthday, you have to check to see whether she understands uh, the vow that she's taking or not. And then we come to the boy and go one year later, 12 years, 13 years, but the structure is identical. In chapter 5, we've got age. In chapter 6, we've got physical signs. But it's clear already from chapter 5 uh, that these are not disconnected, not by any means, because as you saw when you went on here in chapter 5, um, the Mishnah is entirely concerned with physical signs. What I just read was from Mishnah uh, number 6 of this chapter, but when one goes ahead to Mishnah number 7, and I'm not going to read this in detail, uh, you've had the occasion to read it, uh, you can see that the concern of the sages uh, is for uh, physical development, uh, and quite explicitly so. There are arguments about you know, what exactly are, in this case, her physical signs. They talk about breast development and the like. Um, what they're talking about, once again, is clearly puberty. Uh, has a girl at age 12, has a boy roughly at age 13, arrived at the age of puberty. The Gemara in Nida that I asked you to look at um, resolves the tension between age and physical signs. Uh, it notes the different emphases of the texts here in the Mishnah and understands that there's a need uh, to resolve this. And its resolution is very, very straightforward, and that is there are two things that are necessary in order for someone to cons be considered a bat or bar mitzvah. I use that term in the broad sense because the Mishnah here in chapter 6 makes it perfectly clear what that means. Someone is a bat or a bar mitzvah when one is obligated to do all of the mitzvot of the Torah. When does that happen? Well, the Gemara's resolution uh, is the one that you saw. One needs two things. One needs to be a certain age uh, for a girl that is 12 years old, her what we call her 12th birthday, a boy 13, um, and they need to arrive, have arrived at puberty. They need to show actual physical signs of uh, their secondary sexual characteristics. They need to be arriving at a certain kind of adulthood, that is to say, a sexual adulthood. Um, this is about sex. Um, it's about physical maturity, but it's not just about that, because what this chapter also makes clear is that the sages assume that there's an association between understanding and physical development. That is to say, and we observe this all the time, that as young people arrive at puberty and become adolescents, they also develop a different level of understanding, capacity to understand, than they've had before. They're intellectually far more mature than they were before. Uh, and there is, and I leave this to uh, a further discussion perhaps online, uh, perhaps amongst yourselves, but there is undoubtedly some association, and I think it's even an association that the Torah makes uh, in the Garden of Eden story, uh, between sexuality and understanding, understanding the difference between good and evil. Um, if you're 12 without 
beginning puberty, you're not a bat mitzvah. If you're 13 as a boy before beginning puberty, you're not yet a bar mitzvah. Halakhically speaking, you need both. Uh, I like to say that the reason we don't wait to check to make sure that bat and bar mitzvahs uh, have begun their puberty is because that way you couldn't reserve the catering hall um, long enough in advance. Um, but we have to face it. Uh, the truth is that there are many young people, uh, girls and boys, um, who we call bar mitzvahs, who halakhically speaking are not yet that because they have not arrived at puberty. Um, why is all this so important? Um, because to be a bar or bat mitzvah is not to be an adult uh, in the full sense. It is to have become, to begin to be, uh, an adolescent. It is the beginning of a certain kind of adulthood, uh, a sexual adulthood, that carries with it all kinds of baggage. Um, but I want to put this uh, in as simple a way as I can in order to challenge us to discuss something that we rarely discuss, uh, or maybe we do discuss it too often, but in a way that the sources, I think, would challenge us to consider uh, in another fashion. Um, and that is the relationship between sexuality uh, and adolescence and bar and bat mitzvah. How many times have we heard, how many times have we said ourselves that um, we're disappointed by, that would be the nice way, disgusted by, uh, that's if we're being really honest, uh, the kinds of celebrations, the kinds of parties that we see our young people celebrating all too often. It's about the mitzvah, right? They have the right, they take the mitzvah out of the bar mitzvah. Um, it's about the mitzvah. Well, ironically, uh, our young people have intuited something that we actually have forgotten. And that is to say, it may be about the mitzvah, but in fact, the celebration of mitzvot by a 12-year-old girl and a 13-year-old boy is a puberty ritual. That is, when we see that a girl has undertaken the obligation of the mitzvot, or a boy at age 13 has undertaken that obligation, what that means is, what they're saying quite publicly, in fact, is that they've arrived at puberty. Uh, and puberty is one of the most important transitions that any person experiences. Uh, and for me, this comes back to one of the fundamentals of religion, and I don't want to cheat Judaism of this. Uh, religion is about noticing and making sense of that which is important in our lives. That's what rituals do. They help us to understand, to regularize, to give system to things which otherwise might be difficult to understand but are very, very important. We have rituals for birth. We have rituals for marriage. We have rituals for death. We have all kinds of life cycle rituals. And they notice very significant changes in life. Well, why do we imagine that bat and bar mitzvah occurs at age 12 for a girl and 13 for a boy, nothing could be clearer than the Mishnah in Nida and its accompanying Gemara. It is about the ritual celebration of the aborning of adult sexuality. And therefore, now listen clearly, when our children dress up in a way that's perhaps a little bit immodest, a little bit too suggestive, when they flirt in ways that strike us as prematurely adult uh, at the parties, um, when they begin to dance closely, I mean, you can fill all of this and you've seen it as often as, you've seen it more often than I have. Um, they're actually noticing what's important, um, that they are undergoing one of the most significant transitions in their lives. Uh, and the reason they are celebrating this ritual that we call the Bader Bar Mitzvah is because Judaism, at one of the earliest stages of its rabbinic development in any case, and the Torah, of course, nor the rest of the Bible, um, the Torah did not notice this. But the rabbis filled in something important. That is to say, this significant transition needs to be noticed and noticed big. And the way we notice it big in their world was to take on the full responsibility of mitzvot because now that we can have sex... We have to take responsibility for the difference between good and evil. Um, we have to help our children understand that Judaism notices sex. It notices the fact, um, in a very significant way, that they are becoming sexual adults. It considers that extremely important, and it has something to say about it. Not just about ignoring it. This is about mitzvah and not about sexuality. It is about mitzvah. But the reason it's about mitzvah is because mitzvah is a response 
to what happens when one becomes a sexual adult. Uh, I just want to conclude by recalling an article that I saw a number of years ago in the New York Times. I, I tried to find this online on their online archive and didn't succeed. So trust me, it was there. If somebody finds it, please let us all know. Um, this was an article about uh, young uh, Christian uh, adults, children, adults. My recollection is that it was in Texas, and the article was about them having bar bat mitzvah parties. They went to the children, right? These are Christian young people saying, we want bar mitzvah parties. Why? Because their churches actually had no ritual that noticed what was happening to them, and thank God our tradition had a very important ritual, bar bat mitzvah, which noticed what was happening to our young people. And the Christian young people said, you know what? They get it right, and we want to do the same. Well, we did get it right. Um, so let's continue to do so. Let's make sure that bar bat mitzvah is about mitzvah, but also about a recognition that there's something personal, very, very important, that's happening to the young person. And we want to educate about that, and we want to celebrate it as well. I look forward to our discussion.